Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. For the next hour, your hosts will go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam, the provocateur. And Cam, what are we tackling this week? We are going to take on the 1986 Whoopi Goldberg vehicle, Jumpin' Jack Flash. Yeah, uh, I have a lot to say about this film. Uh, I hadn't seen it before, but before we get into that, uh, I'm going to plow through our letterbox.com synopsis. Oh, is this one another novel like War and Peace? It's longer than last week's one. Okay. Is it more War and Peace or Crime and Punishment? It's more War and Peace. Okay. Um, Just like watching this film. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay 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 right jump in jack flash an adventure in comedy terry works for a bank and uses computers to communicate with clients all over the world one day she gets a strange message from an unknown source the message is coded after decoding the message terry becomes embroiled in an espionage ring people are killed and terry is chased Throughout, she remains in contact with this unknown person who needs Terry to help save his life. Is that it? Yeah. That is terrible. An adventure in comedy. Oh my God. Like, if you've written that out, just throw out the paper. or th- You know what? Throw your computer monitor off the balcony because you just don't have it. <laughs> I was going to follow up with throw yourself off, but probably not that far. Not quite. No. You may improve with time, but it's going to take a long time. And it's funny because we've read some that I feel like really nailed the movie and were decently written. Whereas like this one, just the plot synopsis was horrible. Well, if you remember like, I think Hannah or something like that. Yeah. It was three lines and you're like, yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I think North by Northwest was like two lines and it was perfect. So This is... <laughs> nine lines and the first four don't say anything at this point what do we review more movies or letterbox plot synopses so are we uh, a letterboxed hard now or <laughs> please god no <laughs> <laughs> i'm out <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really roll off the tongue does it no i'm hanging up the mic forget it <laughs> yeah <laughs> just me talking to myself again oh, okay right cam I'm not paying Podbean for this. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Cam. So I sort of said it earlier. I hadn't seen this film before. Have you seen this film before? No, this was one of those movies. I was asking my sister about it um, that played over and over and over again on TV when I was young. Um, and yet, for some reason, neither my sister or I ever watched it. I have no idea why. When I brought up the name, my sister's like, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. And I showed her the poster, and she's like, oh my god, I 100% know what that is. But for some reason, uh, in the Smith household, it was a non-entity. Um, so, yeah, no. How about, and you, same with you, right? Yeah, certainly the same with me. I have no recollection of this film whatsoever. I mean, it came out a year before I was born. But I know plenty of films that came out before that year. So that, that doesn't really mean much. And it's not something that played on, on my TV as far as I'm aware. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know why we didn't watch it because we watch so much junk. <laughs> you know, like I look back at 80s comedies and, you know, we were watching like The Great Outdoors over and over again or Troop Beverly Hills or there's just so many of those 80s comedies that are not necessarily well remembered today that we were watching just over and over again. I have no idea why we wouldn't have at some point, you know, taped this one off TV or worked it in the rotation or even just out of, a, you know, curiosity, watched it on a Saturday night or something. Well, it does feel like exactly one of those films that you just sort of have around. It's just kind of on TV when you switch it on. Yeah, well, it's funny because you go to letterbox.com and look at the user reviews of this movie and it is a sea of people who are like, I grew up watching this movie. So, like, I get it. Believe me, I get it. See, I thought originally this was a case of it hadn't made it over the ocean and you just hadn't seen it for some reason. But most people around your neck of the woods had. But it's interesting that you had no idea, really. Yeah, like it wasn't. uh, And we'll get to the box office in a bit, but it wasn't like a huge hit here. Um, I think it was just one of those movies that got 
picked up by a cable network and just rerun into the ground. Um, and it didn't actually play over in theaters uh, in your neck of the woods. So um, it was mostly just a North American release. See, it's interesting that it didn't show in theaters here. It must have played on TV because I was speaking to a friend of the show, Lorraine, from the Once Upon a Nightmare podcast, and she remembers watching it uh, with her brother all the time. So maybe I yeah. just missed it. Well, I mean, I'm sure it was on like beta cassette over there, right? We haven't got there yet. We're uh, we're still using cave drawings and smoke signals. <laughs> You're like drawing the movie on paper and flipping the pages. But like, what would you draw for this film? Is it just a telephone box on its side being dragged along? I would say that is the main sequence that would work in terms of folded paper art. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get to a stray cam, can you give us some background about the film? Yeah. Okay. So this movie... Um was another problem production. We've dealt with a number of those, and some of them turn out great, and some of them don't. Um, this movie, wa it began life as a Shelley Long vehicle, and it was going to be directed by a guy named Howard Zeef, who had directed uh, Private Benjamin with Goldie Hawn, and he would go on to do the two My Girl films that were um, very popular with my generation. Um, not so much me, but a lot of kids in my generation watched them. And... Um, the whole thing at this point was to make Shelley Long a star because she'd been on Cheers. She'd left Cheers to go into movies and not had the best of luck. She starred in Troop Beverly Hills, which did okay, but was really, really badly reviewed. And I think she did another movie called Frozen Assets set in a sperm bank or something. And like no one saw it. Like it was a disaster uh, movie that just, I mean, like two people showed up to see it. Um, so what happened was they're developing this movie and they have a screenplay by a guy named David Franzoni. And he had the story pitch as well as the screenplay. And I would be fascinated to read what his original draft was because David Franzoni, this was early in his career, but he went on to write Gladiator and Amistad. I just want to rewind for a second. Did you say that Shelley Long was in a film about a sperm bank? I did, yes. <laughs> that film does not get made nowadays. Uh, probably not. No, 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 I, it was a different era, Scott. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you could say it, it came and went. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, in, in that movie, antics really get out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, classing up the joint this week on Spy Hearts. <laughs> Start as we mean to go on. Start as we mean to go on. I like that that's what grabs you versus the uh, writer of Gladiator and Amistad writing this film. <laughs> I need to talk about the sperm bank, Cam. This is, what, this is what I need to hear about. Right? So I guess what happened was Franzoni wrote this screenplay, and I don't know if it was intended to be more serious or what, but they end up bringing in two writers, a, a, a pair of writers, Charles Shire and Nancy Myers, who they also wrote um, Private Benjamin. Um, and they would go on to write movies like Father of the Bride um, and, you know, a lot of rom-coms. And actually, Nancy Myers becomes a major director of rom-coms. She did What Women Want, Something's Gotta Give, It's Complicated. She's kind of one of the big names in rom-coms in the 90s and um, even I think a little bit of the 2000s as well. And so those two come in and rewrite this movie. My guess is David Franzoni, if I'm to judge the comic stylings of Gladiator and Amistad, um, I'm wondering if this was a little more of a straight ahead action kind of film and they came in to give it more of that light comedy bounce. That That's just a guess because I don't know because this is one of those movies like um, Cloak and Dagger where production notes on it are minimal at best. So the original writer who you were talking about, did he write it with Shelley Long in mind? I'm guessing he may have just sold the pitch and the screenplay before Shelley Long was attached. That would be my guess. Right. And then they came along. I, I wonder if the narrative is like they made it funny after Shelley Long stopped being involved and they have Whoopi instead. It's I, I get the sense, though, that Shire and Myers joined while Shelley Long was there because Shelley Long was a comedic actress. So they would have been wanting to write a lighter comedy for her. Okay. Yeah, so that seems to be the way this worked. And um, so I think what happened was Shelley Long left at a certain point, And that's when, you know, Whoopi Goldberg got involved. And they started shooting. And Howard Zeef, um quit the movie a week in. 
and was, I guess, just not happy with the way things were going. And so they were desperate and they called Penny Marshall and Penny Marshall, who is a very notable director. Um, she actually just passed, I guess, two years ago about at the time we're recording this, but, um, she was mostly known for Laverne and Shirley. She starred on that show. She had also directed quite a few episodes of the show while she worked there. And um, she had been tempted to jump over and do a major motion picture for a while. She'd been offered um, Peggy Sue Got Married, which Francis Ford Coppola would do and be a really, really good movie. Uh, she was also offered something called The Joy of Sex, which I guess might have think been a thing at the time. I am not familiar with it whatsoever. But ultimately, she said that it was a last minute phone call. It was like, can you do this? And she said, okay, I'll do it. And so she jumped over and took over this movie a week into production and brought one of her writers, um, Chris Thompson, who was a TV writer. He wrote on Laverne and Shirley for a long time, as well as on Booze and Buddies, the Tom Hanks comedy show. And basically, this was a movie that was being rewritten constantly on set by all accounts. Okay. Um, one note I did make, is this our first female director that we've covered so far? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I believe it is. Yeah. We'll have more coming, but I think this is the first one. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that she's, she's doing it, and, and especially in the 80s as well. Yeah, no kidding. Um, apparently, David Mamet, the celebrated screenwriter, wrote a draft of this movie as well that was just filled with profanity. <laughs> and that draft did not see the light of day, really. And he's not credited on the film. I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, this was Whoopi Goldberg's follow-up to The Color Purple, which is kind of astonishing because she's nominated for an Oscar for that movie. That's a Steven Spielberg film from 1985. Um, it's an amazing performance. Check it out if you haven't seen The Color Purple. Um, this is a fascinating follow-up film for a Oscar-nominated dramatic actress at this point. I mean, I have to sort of wonder about the, the timeline of when it was being shot versus her being nominated, but she must have known she was in a good film when she was making it with Spielberg. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Spielberg at this point in time has on a pretty good streak. I mean, he's been, I yeah, I think he's actually been doing fairly strong work at this point. I guess mostly Indiana Jones films, to be fair, but yeah. But I mean, this is this is Whoopi at her height. Maybe she just wanted a film where she could be funnier and and a bit more crazy, I guess. Maybe. I mean, her background was more in comedy, right? Yeah. So I guess it was more like, I want to do what I am naturally more drawn to. Um, but she said that ultimately, <laughs> the reason she went and joined the TV series Star Trek The Next Generation in season two was because she was fed up with the movies she was being given including this Fatal Beauty and Burglar. And she said she knew if she went to Star Trek, she would get good work. And she ended up doing Ghost, so... And winning an Oscar for Ghost as well, yeah. Yeah, there you go. See, Star Trek fixes everything. It really does. Although, I think there's a lot of actors on Star Trek who would disagree with that very strongly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll name no names. I don't recall Wal uh, Walter Koenig, who was Chekhov on the original series, ever winning Oscars. I'm still waiting for Linda Park. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, the Star Trek's one of those properties where it's like you either succeed like hugely, like say Kate Mulgrew or something, or you get typecast, which is so common. Yeah, I mean, you just look at um, Denise Crosby, for instance. She left the show because she was worried she was going to be typecast and then was typecast anyway. Yeah, no kidding. Pet mm. Cemetery is okay, though. True, true. Yeah. Uh, any other facts about the film? Uh, not really. So we can talk about the box office for that year. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the budget was impossible to find, but it, I'm guessing it probably wasn't a huge amount of money. Um, as I said, it was only released domestically. So it made $30 million, which I was kind of like, oh, that's pretty low. But then when you actually look at the tallies worldwide, that was number 35 for the year. So that's actually <laughs> pretty good for just opening domestically. So it only opened in America. There's no international whatsoever, or none recorded at least anyway. None, none. It did not open. A lot of the times in the 80s and what have you, they wouldn't open comedies internationally because they just felt comedy didn't translate very well. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, and so, yeah, number 35, it landed right between a reissue of Lady and the Tramp and the basketball drama Hoosiers. Um, as for that year, the number one movie was, of course, Top Gun, Number two was Crocodile Dundee. 
And number three was Platoon, the Oliver Stone film. That one gets a little controversial because that movie opened, um, I'm guessing, at the tail end of December, um, probably to do with Academy Awards season. And so whether you regard that as a top grocer of 1986 is up in the air. I'll be your wingman anytime, Cam. <laughs> uh, some other notable movies of that year. Um you had Aliens, the James Cameron film, and we'll be covering James Cameron doing True Lies uh, going forward. So that was at number four. Um, at number six, you know, since we're talking Star Trek and Whoopi Goldberg, you know, as a Star Trek icon playing Guinan, at number six, we had Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Great film. In my top Star Trek film, sure. Yep. And co-star of this movie, Annie Potts, also appeared at number 24, Pretty in Pink, which was the big uh, John Hughes production. Okay, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. Interestingly, no spy movies this year. This was the only one. Whereas we've talked about some years where it's like, well, we're going to be tackling like 72 films that year. 1986, it's uh, one and done. Well, I hadn't been born yet. Maybe they were waiting for me. Maybe, maybe. I was a uh, mature six years old at this point. So, Had you started your goth phase yet? Um, yeah, I was listening to The Cure. I had the black nail polish. Um, I was forever walking underneath a rain cloud. <laughs> See, I would be listening to The Smiths because that's the British version of The Cure. Although they're British too. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Although 1986, what's the goth mu- music of 86? I guess it is like The Cure and, um, and and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, it's that sort of downbeat rock. I don't know what the sort of genre is, but... Yeah, because Nine Inch Nails is 89. Yeah. Um, I mean, Metallica were around at this point. They're not well. goth, though. No, no, but like, I'm just thinking of other rock. But yeah, yeah, it's the Smiths yeah, and the Cure, basically. Maybe um, you know, Adamant, more that sort of way as well. That sort of comes in and out sometimes. Maybe the Cult. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> enough about goth rock. What about Jumpin' Jack Flash? <laughs> it's like the third time we've gone off topic already, and it's been ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Back on track. Cam. We've got the facts out. Now, what did you think of the film? Um, <laughs> well, I, I would say that this is a movie that I would probably appreciate a lot more if I'd watched it when I was 12 years old on cable television. Um, this just felt to me like one of those kind of misguided stories you see often in 80s films where it's kind of like they have a premise and they're just taking a popular actor of the time and just being like, carry this thing carry it because you know the comedic material on the page is not there that's kind of how i felt about it and i found it fascinating that you know we covered north by northwest early on in the podcast and i mean that's a movie that i feel like would be classified as a thriller and it's a heck of a lot funnier to me than this movie (laughs) yeah this film like it's uh, a bit of a a bit of an assault on the comedic senses i would say at times well and I want to delve into that as we go, but I'm like, is it or is it just that it's so specifically 80s in terms of its comedy stylings? Because when you look at comedy now, um, you know, say watch a Judd Apatow movie, for example, um, there's a joke landing every like 15 you know, seconds or every 30 seconds at least. And you watch a lot of these 80s comedies and a lot of them are based on sort of here's a wacky premise And the joke is that this character or this actor is in this premise. And that's kind of the joke. Yeah, I feel like I have seen this film before, despite having ever seen this film. Right. Well, I was thinking a lot about the movie Ghostbusters while I'm watching it. Because, you know, you look at that movie. It's a sci-fi sort of uh, supernatural kind of movie. I guess more supernatural than sci-fi, I should say. More horror Mm -hmm. movie. Um, But you are plugging, you know, these four kind of comedic actors into it. And the kind of the joke is their reactions. But I think what works for me in Ghostbusters and doesn't work here is that Ghostbusters, all of the supernatural stuff is incredibly effective and has tension and is actually involving on a story level. Whereas I feel like this one is a spy movie. Uh, I didn't think it was a very engaging spy movie. I thought Whoopi Goldberg was hugely likable. Um, Very charismatic, obviously. She's a, you know, A-class actress. Um, so I'm enjoying what she's bringing to it, but it just felt like a lot of it was her having to try to breathe life into a spy plot that wasn't written very well in the first place. Yeah. I mean, from my side of things, I had no knowledge of this film before finding it for this podcast. 
I was quite excited to watch it because I'm a big fan of Whoopi Goldberg and I know she's a great comedian. But apart from her her you know, comedic chops that sort of carry this film through, and she is her you know her back must have hurt by the end of this film. She is working overtime. I made a note um, here about how Whoopi Goldberg is talking to herself for like fifty percent of this movie. There's something I want to go into a little bit later about that. Remind me when it comes to uh, her talking to herself. One of my notes was that, you know, could an 80s movie 80s any harder than this movie? <laughs> you know, that's the terrifying thing. And I think it's very interesting that this movie um, is opening the year that uh, Top Gun is the number one movie. Because Top Gun is like the epitome of 80s excess. And this movie feels in so many ways representative of 80s comedy you know, not for better or worse, neither one, just all of the elements of 80s comedy being assembled and thrown together here. Yeah, like you, you just sort of uh, figure out what kind of works from other films and piece together. I was thinking a lot of Beverly Hills Cop when I was watching this film. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah. I feel like, you know, Eddie Murphy is, is great in that film and the follow-ups, but I'm sure other comedians could have done that role. Maybe not to the level that Eddie Murphy did. Yeah, well, they wanted Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> did they? Yeah, he was one. He was one of the original choices for Beverly Hills Cop. There was a lot. They actually went through a lot of names before they got to Eddie Murphy. But I have to believe. I'm. I'm glad you brought up Beverly Hills Cop because I have to believe that that movie had somewhat of an influence on this one because that movie comes out in '84. This is '86, um, and Beverly Hills Cop was the biggest hit of 1984, I believe, or it's right up there. It's in the top, you know, group, and. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they were like, we want another kind of tough talking comedian in this film. This is a Joel Silver production. I mean, his movies tend to have more of a basis in action. So it would not shock me if they were looking to try to replicate what worked so well in Beverly Hills Cop here. Yeah, it was only a passing thought in my head, but it's interesting that it came to you as well. Yeah, because you look also, Whoopi Goldberg swears a lot throughout this movie. And it's funny because Mm -hmm. I'm someone who... I don't know that I saw a lot of Whoopi Goldberg films growing up because I was like thinking about it. I never saw Fatal Beauty, which I know was also played on TV a lot, but I did see Ghost and I remember watching Karina Karina, uh, Made in America. There was a handful, but it was never like she wasn't doing a lot of like R rated, like profanity laden comedy, at least from what I was experiencing. So it was kind of a surprise that she had quite a bit of that here. And I have to wonder if a lot of that had to do with sort of the popularization of R-rated comedy action movies um, with like Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, I'd say it certainly fits into that vein that, that was popular during the 80s. And I imagine being rewatched in the 90s as well, which is probably where this film gets a lot of its sort of historic love from. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, this film is, is a bizarre choice for a 32-year-old man. Sorry, 33. I had my birthday recently. Hey, <laughs> I lose track of the years. <laughs> that happens, believe me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I imagine if I watch this as like a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, and you know, she's swearing, there's cool action set pieces. I probably would have loved it. But there's lots of films I loved at 10 that I, I just can't watch again. Yeah, well, like, I guess my example was, and, you know, you referred to um, Lorraine, watching this movie a lot when she was young um i was a big fan of the great outdoors which was a john candy dan Aykroyd film which was Mm -hmm. put out in 88 and i remember my family watched it um up at our summer home and it just became this movie we all loved and watched over and over again and thought was the most hilarious thing ever and um a handful of years ago i was hanging out with a buddy it was kind of when netflix came over to canada so it was you know, a handful of years ago and great outdoors was on there. And I was like, have you ever seen this? He's like, no. And I said, you have to watch it. It's hilarious. And I watched it and I, it was a real nostalgia burster where I'm like, Oh, like I get what we were laughing at, but this movie is literally just an assembly of scenes that have absolutely no connection to one another. (laughs) Yep. That is very true. Now, do you want to know what my childhood rewatching film was? Okay. Can you give me like a year? I don't know what year it was made. Uh, do you want me to quickly look it up? Or just say like late 80s, early 90s, you know, what kind of era? It was definitely made late 90s, I would say. Late 90s. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I was 30 when the millennium... Uh, 30? I was 13 when the millennium hit. So. <laughs> Scott is like Benjamin Button. <laughs> He's been aging backwards. <laughs> 
another film we're referencing over the film we're talking about. The late nineties. Okay, uh, I'm trying to think of something that's not particularly great. It's sort of that you know, kind of good um, at best sort of level. Oh man, something like multiplicity, maybe. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It was led by a male comedic actor who was very popular around the time. Was it Martin Lawrence? Something like uh, Blue Streak or Nothing to Lose? Okay, I can give you slightly more hints now because I looked up the year it was created. Okay. It was put out in 2000. 2000. Was it um, Bringing Down the House with Steve Martin? Nope. Okay. Uh... I'll give you one more hint because obviously we could do a whole hour on you trying to guess this film. Sure. Uh, the the co star was Renee Zellweger. Uh oh, from two thousand. Oh my god, what was she doing in two thousand? Because I remember her career after Jerry Maguire kind of struggled for a bit. Um, was it Nurse Betty with Morgan Freeman? No. no? no. Uh, I don't remember what else she was doing in two thousand. Okay, so I'll give you a little picture. I have four brothers. We're all sitting around watching a film, and I remember laughing to the point of crying whilst watching this film. Okay. It was the Jim Carrey comedy, Me, Myself, and Irene. Oh, I forgot she was in that. Yeah, okay. Yep, Fairly Brothers, not one of their best, but I can 100% see how you know young Scott would be drawn to watch that movie over and over again. Yeah, and I just can't bring myself to go back to it now because I know it will just completely destroy it. Yeah, like for me, in terms of Jim Carrey films, the film that we obsessed over in my house was Ace Ventura, the first one, which I have to say, all the comedy has aged perfectly to this modern day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Shifting oh. uncomfortably. Um, <laughs> and we were also big fans of The Mask. That was the other one. The Mask, I think we memorized the Cuban Pete musical sequence. See, we were a big liar, liar family. We, oh, okay. uh, we, we would often yeah. draw on each other's heads in blue pen. Um, but I was going to say, speaking of musical um, scenes in uh, The Mask I was referring to, but that is another 80s trope that this movie has all over the place, which is musical sequences. And the whole time, you know, we have like a um, dancing montage to the song Jumpin' Jack Flash because the Whoopi mm -hmm. Goldberg character has been in communications over her computer at work with a spy who's trapped in Eastern Europe. And he uses the codename Jumpin' Jack Flash. And she doesn't know the password, so she needs to get it from the song. And so she, she's listening to the Rolling Stones song and just dancing in a montage for like a minute. And I just thought, I will guarantee you that in 1986, audiences were screaming with laughter at that. Do you, uh, do you want a couple of facts about that song? I do, yeah. So firstly, uh, do you remember that line that she gets confused about? Yeah. Okay, do you want the actual line? Yeah, give it to me. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to read what she thinks it was, but uh, the actual line was, I was raised by a toothless, bearded hag. Huh. Well, there you have it. <laughs> I mean, you have to do it in sort of a Mick Jagger voice to make it sound more like it, but, you know. And the password that she, I think was it a pass key, she calls it, like a cipher or something? Yeah. Um, she writes it as B flat, as in the word flat. Right. That's not how you write B flat. Okay. You cannot believe how much that bugged me as being a sort of a musician on the side. It's capital B, lowercase b, not B flat. Scott, I am not going to question the computer science of this movie because I had a <laughs> lot of notes about the use of computers in this movie. <laughs> Did they have MSN in 86? What are they uh... having texting each other? Well, okay, so yeah, a little bit of setup there. Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg works at like an international bank doing transfers, and she often communicates with um, um, I, I clients, I guess, who are sending money their way. And it's like a text-based messaging system, and that's how she makes contact with this um, Jack, uh, codename Jack character. Um, and yeah, it's just like an early version of, I guess, Messenger in 86. I guess it's possible that you would have maybe had that in... Uh, like business operations like this? I don't know. I had questions, but I, then I was also very baffled that these computers could pick up TV signals. Uh, that was a real head scratcher. In, in perfect, well, you know, perfect standard definition, I would say. Yeah, of like Russian gymnasts um, uh, every day at like, uh, yeah, like a Russian TV satellite being beamed 
to a 1986 like a desktop computer uh okay yeah is it is it a tv or is it a computer which one is it folks but then don't forget cam the computer also gains sentience a little bit later on in the film um are you talking about when she enters the password and it like comes to life and there's like all these like crazy graphics going on I can almost believe that they have, because that's at least in pixels, but when it actually starts communicating his voice to her, <laughs> and it's not like it's in her head, people can hear it because they, they respond to it. Yeah. So yeah. Like, could they, does it have like text to talk on 86 computers? Okay, the text, to t- the text to talk thing, I was wondering if that was just a plot mechanic and it wasn't actually talking. I'm pretty sure that was all in her head. Really? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was baffled oh, as well. Okay. All right. I think that was a way of um, bringing character into it because you want to have Jonathan Price's voice there um, to establish a connection between the characters. So either A, it's all in her head, or B, the text to talk thing was basically an invention just as a way to have Jonathan Price being, you know, uh, heard on screen. Okay. So I was going to wait till we got to sort of Jumpin' Jack Flash himself. Yeah. To talk about this. Uh, and I suppose it's the end reveal of the film. But obviously, for those who haven't watched the film, Jonathan Price, who's you know a famous character actor, uh, most recently was in uh, Game of Thrones, off the top of my head. Yep, he's in the Pirates of the Caribbean films, and he was a Bond villain sure. in uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Certainly was. Um, was it not the most underwhelming reveal at the end of the film <laughs> well they build it up so much it's hilarious actually because you have stephen collins um disgraced actor stephen collins uh... um playing a quote-unquote co-worker of Whoopi goldberg's who's often stumbling into this situation and i mean like stephen collins in 1986 is the epitome of the 1986 like um white collar dreamboat you know it's kind of got the mullet the glasses um the blonde flowing locks. I mean, he's nowadays looks pretty cheesy, but I'm sure in 86 people were quite taken with him. Uh, but I like that they build up, you know, him being kind of this friend of Whoopi Goldberg's. And then he goes to see her at the end when she's going to meet up with Jack at a restaurant and Jack doesn't show up. And you're kind of like, oh, maybe she's going to wind up with this character. His name was Marty. Um, because I could kind of see that in a 1986 uh, comedy. And then yeah. you're like, oh, I guess not. And so Jack does show up and you're like, okay, if she's turning down Stephen Collins, um, who is the replacement? Jonathan Price, straight from the movie Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Honestly, that may have been my favorite moment of the movie because you're just like, wow, okay. Apparently, 1986 was a very kind year for Jonathan Price. I mean, who knew this man was a sex symbol? I heard he was on, like, Tiger Beat magazine that year. <laughs> I, I I, got... I didn't... To be fair, I hadn't read who the cast of this film was. I knew Whoopi was in it, obviously. Um, and I didn't recognize the voice. I probably should have going through. But when he showed up on screen, I thought, Him? I was in the same boat. Um, I also didn't recognize the voice. It's funny because actually my sister was looking up the cast and she threw out his name, but I completely forgot about it until he showed up at the very end and I saw, you know, that it was Jonathan Price. Are you saying you forgot something about this film? Um, well, uh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) The actual spy plot element, did you find it kind of, um, all over the place? I thought it was actually on a good track for a while. Yeah, early on, yeah. Yeah, and then it was after the scene um, in the consulate for the second time. Mm -hmm. I felt like it just lost itself. I think when you have this type of plot in a comedy, you have to keep it fast-paced. And fast-paced comedy means a very different thing now versus 1986. Um, But I just think that, like, boy, it, it feels a little saggy. And you don't want that, especially in that second half where, like, you know, when she's going to, like, crash the, like, salon um, sequences like that. Like, the sequence in itself is okay, but at that point, the plot has gotten so convoluted that it's just like, like, what's going on? Like, okay, she has to do this now? Okay, sure. And I think, like, honestly, if you cut this to 90 minutes and make it a much faster-paced movie, it would probably work better. Yeah, I mean, this film is an hour and 45 minutes. Now, North by Northwest is two hours, and I didn't feel it. It was over two hours. It was 
Right, there you go. This film, I, I actually watched it with my better half, uh, the, Miss H, I should say, Miss H. Uh, and she actually watched it with me, which is a rare occurrence for a film I'm covering. But she heard Whoopi Goldberg was in it, so she was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll give it a try. And she was loving it for the first half. Yeah, I was thinking, like, this movie has a lot of energy. I was really... I would say the first like half hour, 40 minutes, I was like, look, this movie's not a laugh riot, um, you know, removed from 1986 for me. But I can also, uh, you know, appreciate the energy that Whoopi Goldberg has and, you know, the setup and just the fact that this movie is filled with, uh, you know, comedians who would go on to be very famous. And we'll name check those a little bit later. Yeah. And so we got to around about the second half, uh, funnily enough, just after the, the second time in the consulate. Mm hmm um with the, the the dress and the shredder incident where she goes from diana ross through to tina turner in in a minute or so i actually think that might be the movie's maybe a comedic high point like the physical comedy she has in that shredder sequence is very funny it was very like different for Whoopi gobo from what i'm used to i felt the same way i was like wow i'm not used to seeing Whoopi do things like this like i feel like once Whoopi does star trek she becomes kind of this being in movies who kind of exists above us all. You know, you look at Ghost, it's the same kind of thing. So like kind of like her two big uh, pop culture acclaimed performances are kind of these beings that exist almost outside of the realm of us mere mortals. Mm -hmm. Now, after the concert scene, you know, I'm still kind of invested in the film. Obviously, I have to watch it. I look over to Miss Hatred at my side and she's completely asleep. Oh, uh, yeah, that's not necessarily the response you want um, <laughs> in a comedy. No, I, 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 I can't even say that she tuckered herself out during the day. Perfectly normal day. And I don't know what it was, but I guess it must have been not long after. Cause she was commenting on the sort of Diana Ross, Tina Turner switch with the dress and everything in the hair. Um, but then she just lost it. She just went. And I guess that's just where a lot of interest went for me, too. Well, I think you want to foreground the comedy in this type of movie and background the spy plot. So you want to keep the spy plot relatively simple. Um, and I think what happens in the second half is it starts to push the spy plot up front, which isn't as engaging. I'd agree. Now, before we touch on the sort of big bad of this film, I, I wanted to touch on one of the henchmen. And I wanted to ask you a question, Cam. Mm -hmm. Jim Belushi stars as one of the henchmen in the film. Yeah. Is he this film's Tom Hollander? Um, maybe in intention, but not in execution. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tom Hollander was amazing in uh in Hannah. Um, I don't know that Jim Belushi is amazing in Jumpin' Jack Flash. <laughs> I suppose I mean more towards like, is he the worst henchman in the world? Yeah, like, he is outdone several times over. Well, it's funny because this movie does get very obsessed with its spy plot, but it also never really has any sense of danger because the villains who are being sent after Whoopi Goldberg are kind of bumbling. Like Jim Belushi is a total bumbler through all his scenes. You know, he's getting hit in the head with frying pans and flipping his car and just looking like a buffoon. Um, but that's kind of the case for a lot of the villains. And I'm I'm not sure it's a great thing to constantly make the uh, the evil your you know heroine is facing look just like you know goofballs no it certainly takes some of the stakes away you, i didn't feel that she was in particularly any danger no it seems like her contacts you know are in danger all these other spies are like shot down you know right on the spot like jerome crabbe who shows up and he was the villain a year later in the living daylights um but uh yeah it's like it's more like violence happens around her but when it comes to her being captured or what have you, they really, really put on the kid gloves. Yeah, there's apart from sort of one scene right towards the end, which I did laugh at, which was when the, the big bad uh, John Woods character, Jeremy Talbot, has her with a couple of henchmen in a warehouse. And they you know, start threatening her with swords on her fingers and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, he holds a gun to her head, and he's also threatening her with a circular saw. Like, if you're going to shoot someone, the sword doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> I guess it was just a scare. Um, yeah. I thought it was very noteworthy that um, one of the goons is played by Tony Hendra. And Tony Hendra 
is maybe not a name that people remember, but he was the like crazed agent in This Is Spinal Tap. And so when he showed up, I'm like, oh, he's going to deliver the comic gold. Nope. If that's the guy, I think it is. He barely says a word. Yeah, he doesn't really say anything. It's like a silent, heavy performance versus in Spinal Tap. He's like a lunatic wielding a cricket bat. Is he British in that? Yeah. Okay, maybe he is just British then. Um, okay, well, okay, let, let's let's look at some of the the cast of bad guys because there's quite a few. Um, what did you think of, of John Wood? Yeah, as the, the guy who's the KGB mole at the consulate. And I just had a question about the consulate uh, briefly, Scott. As a mm-hmm. British person... Do you enjoy how American films always introduce Brit- uh, British things with that music? Doing the dun, 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 dun. I mean, I'm certainly used to it. Yeah. But then this film assumes that I know the lyrics to a Jumpin' Jack Flash and all Rolling Stone songs, which I do not. Yeah, me neither. I was like, oh, I don't know that one. I, I know Sympathy for the Devil, but... Uh, <laughs> I, to be fair, I used to know this song because my band used to play it. So fair enough. Sure. Or Paint It Black, I know as well. Um, don't know uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash, to be fair. There's there's one person in the console that I resonated with. And it was, I don't remember the character's name or the actor's name, but he's somewhat of a famous actor. Uh, but his wife just go, just shouts out randomly, I'd really like to go home now. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, I would too. Yeah. Uh, John Wood, um, he's fine. I don't know. He's one of those uh, uh, totally forgettable 80s villains. I guess he gets kind of a comedic moment at the end where Whoopi Goldberg uh, bites his nether regions and he's just like, who is this woman? But uh, he's mostly there just to be kind of stuffy. Isn't that just a bizarre choice again as well? That How he how she uh, outwits him at the end. It's a little strange. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. If you're there, I guess. It's the 80s, Scott. It's the 80s. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. But like, I, I'm looking for the IMDb right now, and this film is filled with a lot of generic white dudes. Oh, yeah, tons, tons. Stephen Collins, John Wood, Jonathan Price, I guess. Ooh, <laughs> sorry, Jonathan Price. <laughs> nah. Yeah, I mean... He's just not a guy I can confuse with other people, so that's why I say it. Like, I think you could accuse... Um, say some of the office people just because they don't get a lot of funny stuff to do but like you have so many comedians showing up throughout the course of this movie like i mean in the office you have phil hartman and you have john lovitz not really doing anything particularly hilarious but they're there (laughs) Mm. and you've also got like i was shocked to see carol kane yeah carol kane gets the most to do she's probably the funniest in terms of the supporting cast of this movie it was just nice to see her in something in the 80s. I, I completely forgotten anything prior to sort of Kimmy Schmidt, really. Sure, yeah. And I mean, she was a comedy staple of this era in particular. You'd see her pop up in a lot of movies and TV. Um, Another one, though, you had Annie Potts uh, show up as the wife of a spy in this movie. And I'm like, oh, awesome, Annie Potts. This is like two years removed from Ghostbusters. Her star was on the rise. I'm sure she's going to get some awesome stuff to do in this movie. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> skipped yeah like she's there she does her job but there's no real comedy to that character and that character kind of vanishes at a certain point as well one question i wrote down in my notes and i'm not sure if you'll know the answer because you're from canada um but all these people in the uh, office with whoopi goldberg are they all snl vets um so let me think here. Hartman and Lovitz were, um, but at this point, they I don't think they were on it yet. Um, this, oh. is, this is like they're, so they're probably in a, I don't know what comedy troupe they belong to in those days, but I'm mm. guessing Whoopi Goldberg may have been familiar with them or actually Penny Marshall too. Penny Marshall obviously is big in the world of comedy herself. So she would have probably known them through, um, you know, the comedy scene. That's my guess because, you know, you also, you know, when you get to the big gala there at the embassy, um, there's a married couple that show up and it's played by Michael McKeon from um, this is spinal tap and Tracy Ullman, who was a, you know, is a very well-known comedian as well. Mm-hmm. And once again, they don't get anything funny to do, but they're there. Maybe you're right. Maybe that's what it was. It was just a case of her knowing what the New York comedy scene is at the time and just casting all her friends in little bit roles. Like, I think it's actually a good idea to cast like fun 
you know, comedians in small parts that maybe don't mean much because they're more memorable. Like had Michael McKeon's role or Tracy Ullman's role been played by just, you know, random background extra number five, I would not even be mentioning them right now, but they are a little bit memorable just because they kind of pop in their very, very brief screen time, just in terms of playing a very functional performance type. Yeah, I, they make an impact on the film. You do remember their faces at least. Yeah, and I mean, Penny Marshall also casts her brother, Gary Marshall, as the police officer that Whoopi Goldberg deals with at the station, who ha- she has a real back and forth with. I think it's funny that Gary Marshall gets like the most comedic stuff for a guest star in this movie, despite being not really like a huge comedic name. He's actually a director uh, in his own right. He directed Pretty Woman, uh, Exit to Eden, uh, Valentine's Day. Let's just say he's done some good things and some really bad. Uh, he also did Runaway Bride, actually. That's another one he did. Yeah, but has he actually washed anyone's mouth out with steel wool? Uh, not yet. Uh, and I think, he's passed, good, good. I think he's passed away, so it may be too late, yeah. Uh, that's for the best, I suppose. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... You said he did some bad stuff. I don't know what it meant. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to see, you know, Penny Marshall directing her brother. And her brother was directing on his own at this point, so... And this is her first movie, so it's kind of that you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, boosting the sibling up for their movie debut. And uh, Penny Marshall, we should say, I mean, this may be her debut and we maybe don't feel the strongest about it. But I mean, she would go on to have a trifecta of home runs because she would go, you know, after, right after this movie, she would go and do the movie Big starring Tom Hanks, which was a mm-hmm. massive hit. Then she would do Awakenings, the drama with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, which is fantastic as well. And then she would close out her uh, three film streak with A League of Their Own in 92, which was also a big hit. And actually, I think is a really, really good movie. So before we sort of go into any particular scenes we enjoy or anything like that, I don't think we've really thrown enough love Whoopi's way. Okay. And I said this before, she obviously carries this film all the way through and she is throwing out her comedic chops that I'm not used to seeing personally. Yeah, it's true. Like, I don't know that it's unusual for this era. Like, I guess we'd have to delve into Fatal Beauty and, uh, you know, Burglar. So when uh, Whoopi Hards um, kicks off, <laughs> we'll do that. But um, uh, yeah, like, I don't know if this was outside the norm for her comedy at that particular time, but it was fun to see. And even just like a moment, another very 80s moment, and we talked about musical numbers earlier, but like when she starts dancing to and doing the karaoke routine to Can't Hurry Love, at the embassy Mm -hmm. i mean like i can't say i was rolling in the aisles when i'm watching it but i was also going like i have never seen Whoopi goldberg do something like this no when she is caught working late by that boss character i can't recall the name of Mm -hmm. um and you know one minute she's just talking to him and then she's like begging him crying to you know get the promotion and she sort of switches that comedy on in a heartbeat yeah so like i think it's fun to see her do stuff like that she also gets the big sequence in the telephone booth um, mm-hmm. which that whole sequence was Penny Marshall's idea. That was not in the original uh, conception of the movie that um, the previous director was working on. I mean, I don't know what they were trying to do by stealing the whole phone box. That I don't know. Um, but I feel like in this type of comedy, you're supposed to just go with it, which I could. Um, mm-hmm. it, was, it was directed reasonably well, but a, a, little, a little drawn out. Uh, it was kind of fun, though. Yeah, is that and the shredder scene are probably the two highlight scenes that will stick in my mind about this film. Yeah, same here. And you know that if they did that uh, telephone box sequence now, it would be like a CG telephone box bouncing all over the place. I appreciated just seeing the practical telephone box dragged behind a car. It just it just makes you think practical effects. If you can do it, do it properly and do it in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you could tell though that that is a little bit too of that. Beverly Hills Cop kind of kind of influence like it has that sort of action comedy element there like I don't know that this movie really brings the action very much but that's one of the sequences that's trying to and I guess we get a big action finale as well in the office where you have another 80s trope which is a villain with an Uzi shooting up the office and I mean that is so 80s a lot of glass breaking that's a Joel Silver specialty right there played by another generic dude uh, yeah, I recognized him, though, because he's the guy. Um, I know where he's from. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think he's the guy who gets blown up in the plane in uh, Cliffhanger near the start of the movie. Oh, that's not where I thought he was from. 
Okay, where did you think he was from? I seem to recall him as the made-up friend of Riker in the Arsenal of Freedom. Oh, possible. Yeah, another Star Trek reference. Um, I haven't watched the Arsenal of Freedom for quite a while, so you may be right. Hmm. Um, okay, is any other things you want to mention about the film? Well, I guess I just want to talk a little bit while we're discussing Whoopi Goldberg. Just kind of loop back on her talking to herself through this entire film. Like, I feel like a lot of the, you know, this movie was being rewritten constantly. And I just feel like so much of this movie just fell on Whoopi Goldberg of like, you got to carry us from this scene to the next. You know, there's a scene where she just starts doing like a Ray Charles impression. And I'm like, I feel like this was Whoopi come up with something funny right now. We need to fill this moment. Or like it was from her live comedic act or something like that. Yeah. Like it just felt like vamp, Whoopi. Vamp. Yeah. And yeah, it just filled the silence. Exactly. Yeah. That's a, it's a good thing to point out. And I think of the person they chose, Whoopi was the right call to do that. Yeah. I think uh, Roger Ebert raised an interesting point in his review. He didn't really care for the movie. He gave it, I think, two stars. But he talked about how the movie felt kind of strange, how Whoopi Goldberg seemed to have zero human connection with any other actor in the movie, uh, except for maybe Jonathan Price at the end. Um, but I also wonder if that's intentional, that she feels removed from you know her office and everything. So I don't know that that I would you know lob as a criticism, but I wonder if it makes the movie feel kind of a little strange because you're surrounded by so many uh, recognizable actors now and they don't seem to really have any sort of spark with her. Well, it's just that they don't mean anything more or less for the film. All these big actors that you know now, I suppose, like you say, they don't really do anything for the plot except for maybe Stephen Collins and I guess Jonathan Price. I would say Stephen Collins is the primary character that I think we're supposed to care about in terms of their relationship with Whoopi Goldberg. But did you feel like his character really popped off screen uh, in a way that was that memorable to you? I mean, I, I didn't even think about him. Until he turned up at the end and said he was a CIA agent, I didn't really give his character any extra thought. Yeah. Although I, I figured out he was a CIA agent pretty much the second he showed up. Is it because he didn't fit in with the rest of the office, basically? Yeah, it's kind of like when you have recognizable actors showing up, you know, being like, oh, hi, I'm just here to work in the office. I'm like, okay, you're either the villain or you're a, you know, a uh, helper. And as the movie kept going, I'm like, okay, he's a helper. I was thinking more about the sort of Steve Buscemi in high school. Okay, yeah, sure. What up, fellow young people? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so before I get into, uh, I guess, my final thoughts on the film, I did have a question for you. Yeah. Now, apparently, according to Whoopi Goldberg and the writers of this film, all English people finish their phone calls with the following sentence. God save the Queen. Bon vivant. Arrivederci. Well, that's how you end every one of these podcasts. I just edited it out. How dare you? I never listen to the end. <laughs> well, you don't get the raw file. I uh, just cut that off and because I'm like, oh, geez, this is too much, Scott. Enough, enough. And just the fact also that every time you go to sign off, I hear dun, 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 dun. <laughs> God save our gracious queen. No. <laughs> okay, so back to the question. If that's the British way of hanging up the phone, What's the Canadian way? Hockey's on, click. (laughs) We've been like, Tim Hortons is open. See ya. (laughs) That too. Um, uh Uh-oh, my syrup tipped over. I gotta go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, a beaver's eating my house. I gotta go. (laughs) I'm being chased by a wild moose. Help. Okay, all right. Yeah, There's several options there. I can toss those out all day long, yeah. Uh, are, we, are we talking about the sperm bank again? <laughs> oh, no. Please, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a couple of notes I'll mention. Um, I don't know if the music of this movie really stood out to you. <laughs> uh, like uh, the score? Apart from that really bizarre sort of like synth bass track towards the beginning. Yeah. I can't really remember anything. Yeah, like a lot of this movie, the soundtrack is just popular songs because you have Whoopi Goldberg, you know, lip syncing to that to that song I mentioned earlier. You also have during the telephone booth sequence, it's, you know, scored to Rescue Me, that 80s song, which was, I thought, a little on the nose. But um, the score for this movie, it's kind of one of those wacky 80s comedy scores. It was done by Thomas Newman, 
who would go on to score Skyfall and Spectre. No way. Yeah. We got a lot of James Bond connections in this movie between Jonathan Price, Jerome Crabbe. Yeah. There's also a slight nod to Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, I mean, this whole movie is kind of a riff on North by Northwest. What was the uh, the the mention? I didn't pick up on it, I don't think. Slightly more on the nose, I think, unless it wasn't a reference at all. But right at the beginning, she jumps on a bus and then a rather large white dude goes to get on the bus and the door slams in his face and it drives off. Oh my God, I didn't pick up on that. I got to go back and watch that while I still have my YouTube rental. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. This movie was also shot by Matthew Leonetti. Uh, he doesn't have any Bond connections, but if you go through his filmography, he's one of the big cinematographers. This was earlier in his career, but he did movies like Poltergeist as well. He actually did that before this. Um, it's just like a string of movies you've seen. So he's one of the big cinematographers of the era. Um, I don't know that he puts this one on his CV, but, uh, you know, it's notable. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? I guess just last, I will bring up the sequence with the truth serum, the sodium chloride. This is like a comedic set piece, and we're going to actually tackle a movie coming up that you haven't seen that has an extended sequence dealing with uh, this substance. But I'm curious mm -hmm. how this one played for you. I, I thought it was really odd because her voice got really gravelly as soon as she was injected. I never really understood that choice. Yeah. Um, but no, I, it seemed a bit weird. And then she goes, it turns up at the, at work and she turns up at the salon. I didn't really, it didn't really work for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like at this point I was, a, I don't want to say checked out because I was taking notes. So obviously I'm engaged if I'm sitting there taking notes on everything that's going on, but it was kind of, uh, it had kind of lost me at this point a little bit. Yeah. I mean, this sort of comes way past the second consulate thing at this point i i think i said to myself is this film still going mm -hmm. and you, you would think like the telephone scene is is right towards the end but there's still another 20 minutes after that yeah there is yeah this movie also falls into that trope that isn't uh great where a lot of it is telling versus showing where a lot of the spy stuff is just her talking back and forth to jonathan price and him writing back what he's doing and that's not the most interesting thing to see. And I don't know the way around that in a movie where she's talking in a text-based communication system, but it doesn't give the movie a lot of tension. Just having a character type back, like I'm in danger. Oh, okay. I'm going to go meet a contact now. Like that sort of stuff is kind of rough to work around. I mean, maybe if it was like a phone call instead, maybe because then, yeah. and then Jonathan price could at least sort of, show signs of worry because he couldn't really have any inflection in a computer dialogue do you think if they made this movie now you'd have an encrypted phone call it'd be over zoom oh okay right okay so you'd have a no, lot that's, of glitches that's not, it's not encrypted <laughs> at all oh, yeah. the audio would stutter he'd get the wrong location he'd end up getting killed yeah exactly yeah because i just had to wonder about that like this movie being so in the 80s, they're, they're really, I'm guessing for them, they're looking at this communication system as sort of a high tech means of communication. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they would go with a way that is obviously more personable, um, you know, whether it is a phone call or a video conference or something. And I think that would give you more of that human connection, but also carry you a little more in the suspense of what's going on with Jonathan Price's character. Because I got to be honest, throughout this entirety of this movie, I don't think I was ever concerned about Jonathan Price's character. No, not once. Yeah. Because he can't really install any fear in it because it is a computer reading the voice or it's in Whoopi's head either yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but like if you made it a video call, if they were to some reason and remake this film. Um, yeah. I mean, you think of a film like Searching with John Cho. Yeah, I was going to mention that one. Yeah. Yeah. You could do all kinds of all kinds of things with just video chat. Mm -hmm. yeah well scott if you want to uh write a remake of jumping jack flash uh, i'll co-sign it i mean it wouldn't take much to improve this <laughs> it's almost perfect that's right okay cam we've spent god knows how much time chopping this film to pieces okay i'm gonna ask you the ultimate question does jumping jack flash make the knock list not a chance in hell but i will say this um 
I, regardless of, you know, how you interpret what we've said throughout this episode, like, I don't think this is a terrible movie. This is not like a one star movie in my mind. It's just very mediocre and the type of 80s comedy that hasn't aged particularly well, at least for me. Um, but like, it's the type of thing I can totally see someone tuning in for on a Saturday afternoon if it's airing on TV or whatever. Uh, I don't know, streaming clips of it on YouTube and just kind of like being like, oh, you know, like Whoopi Goldberg's really fun on screen. But in terms of it being a movie that belongs alongside North by Northwest and um, God, what's been inducted at this point? Hannah, uh, Goldeneye. No, it's not up to snuff. Uh, I'm completely on the same boat as you with that one. I remember, I don't know where I heard the quote from, so I can't attribute it to anyone, but I remember reading or hearing at some point that when you make art, you have to try and make it somewhat timeless. Mm -hmm. Um, So when it comes to scoring, when it comes to stylizing that sort of stuff, this film is entirely stuck in the 80s. Yeah. 80s is such a specific period, though. Like, I... I would say the 80s comedies that have endured, you know, Ghostbusters, Beverly Hills Cop, um, you know, there are a lot of them, but I feel like no matter what, they're very 80s. Risky Business as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't know. 80s is such a specific decade. I mean, I guess every decade has its own feel, uh, except the 2000s, which are the epitome of bland. But um, Mm -hmm. the uh, the 80s-ness of it I don't see as necessarily a negative. It's just that it doesn't have the things that make a great 80s comedy really, you know, the elements are kind of there in that you have a really good director, you have Whoopi Goldberg, but it just feels like it's not as focused as it needed to be. No, and I think if you took it out of the 80s and and as we were talking about, redid it for now, I don't think it would work as it is on the page. No, you'd have to completely drastically overhaul the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so don't get me wrong though, folks. It's a no for the knock list from me, but if you're looking for a film that you can put on in the background whilst you're looking at your phone and you happen to like Whoopi Goldberg comedies, go ahead. It's almost perfect for sort of passive watching. How do you compare it to um, Cloak and Dagger, which we reviewed fairly recently? Another very 80s, um, high concept sort of comedy. I would say I connected more with this film, but oh, only slightly more. You see, I prefer Cloak and Dagger because I feel like um, the director had more of a, uh, um, and writer had more of a subversive approach to the material in that they were doing kind of weird things with a spy film and a kid's film versus this mm. one, which feels much more of a, you know, kind of follow the playbook of what an 80s comedy is at this point. I suppose I just laughed more at this film than Cloak and Dagger, and what Cloak and Dagger isn't a comedy, right? But I also couldn't put myself in the shoes of a ten-year-old kid because I'm not one. Well, you are because you're aging into one, Benjamin Button. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let my secret out, Cam. Okay, <laughs> I'm two. I'm two kids in an adult suit. <laughs> <sighs> um, but yeah, I overall, it's an okay film, but there's no way that this is making the knock list. So that is a no from me and a no from you, Cam. Yep. So there you have it, folks. Jumping Jack Flash is not on the knock list. And with that revelation, the dossier on this film is complete and filed as classified. But Cam, hopefully we can do better next time. What do we have coming up? We're headed back to Franchise Town, baby. We're tackling 2004's Born Supremacy, which introduces Paul Greengrass as the director, and he would go on to very much define what a Born film is. I have not seen this movie in a long time. I'm looking forward to revisiting it. Yeah, me too. Um, now, don't forget, folks, you can find the knock list, all the films that we have covered and the films that we're going to be covering over on letterboxd.com slash spyhards. And, of course, you can always follow us discreetly at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, good luck among the shadows.